Thank you. Oh, I think it's enough to hold this. So, the last time I was here, no, it, it wasn't the Big Data Universe 1.0, it was a rap concert. So, <laughs> it's strange because I can be on the same stage as Denise. So, <laughs> it's a cool feeling. So, it's some kind of a rap concert now. So, yes, my name is Janos Sendivarga. I work for a company called Graphaware. We do consultancy in Neo4j, which is the one of the graph databases on the market. So I will talk about uh, search and searching. So let's start with this. Okay, I know this is not a UI conference, I hope. So, <laughs> but do you know what is the most frequently used UI element nowadays? No, nobody? Okay, it's search box, yes. Because we have big data, we have a lot of information, and it's, it's pretty hard to find the most relevant information we are looking for. So I will talk about the searching, uh, but let's start with a, with a historical thing. So uh, the evolution of the internet search. This picture is from a blog post from Daniel Sullivan. You can see the URL, you can watch the video. Uh, it's a blog post. Uh, they, they do uh, every Friday this kind of events uh, called uh, whiteboard, whiteboard Fridays. And it's a cool thing. We started in my previous company and uh, you can share a lot of information with the others and it's very useful. So they made this presentation about the history of internet search. So let's start with the 1.0 searching. It was in the prehistoric times when, when there was no Facebook at all. So the first internet search engines uh, uh, were about to search the text of, of the pages. So uh, it concentrated only on the content of the pages. And this was uh, Alta Vista and Yahoo, or not Yahoo. Uh, and, and this was a pretty simple complex, uh, but a lot of uh, data. So, uh, it's kind of similar than now a junior data scientist uh, use word vectors and it's pretty the basic concept they start. So the search 1.0 was about the same. So use the words on the page. So 2.0 was about the links, the relationships between the pages, the clicks. So they started to use some feedback, like the number of clicks, and do some fancy metrics like page rank. And this was the time when Google started this business, the internet search. In 3.0, they do the vertical searches where you have different domains like image search, sport event search, e-commerce search. So it, it was separated the things and you can get more focused results when, when you use the internet searchers. So for the zero, they started to make it personal. They use the, your historical track record they use your social activity, they use your uh, location to get more relevant results uh, in the search page. So, for example, if you are searching for football, for example, you have to get different results if you are in the US or if you are in the UK, because football uh, has different meanings in this uh, territories. So the 
next step was the search 5.0, which was about the knowledge graph. The, it was more than about the pages because all the guys are looking for uh, entities and not pages where the, the description are. So, so you you wanted to find the exact things in the world. So that's the case, which is nowadays. And there was a search 6.0. It was called PRISM, and this slide is about three or four years old. So uh, finally, it turned out that the PRISM uh, searching uh, method is a dead end, so they don't use it anymore. So that was the evolution of internet search. And what about the search we are doing in our application, in, in our online services, or in corporate environments? Last year, uh, this is a slide from my presentation, we started to use the polyglot architecture, which means we have different databases for different purposes. That's cool, but how to, how to proceed from this. So, in corporate search, we started to use different databases. That's cool. We have a big data architecture. It's not a vision anymore, so most of the companies uh, have this infrastructure. They started to use it for fancy things. We hired a lot of data scientists. I think there are some here in the room, too. So we started to use indexers to index our big data sets, uh, which is usually based on a Lucene index. And we started to use the search engines, uh, which are basically another NoSQL database where we store all the information we want to search on. So. We started to use Elasticsearch, Solar, for example. And for example, if you install the Cloudera, you can get the Cloudera search, which is basically Solar. So it's the part of the big data infrastructure, the search engine. So after that, we should handle these things separately because it's a pretty complex task to to feed the search box. So there are a lot of things behind the scenes when we use search. So we started to use a separate search infrastructure. So the first step was like this similar. We have an elastic search. We have a lot of indexed documents. We have a front end and uh, the front end can call via REST API, the Elasticsearch, and we can get the results. But the main question is here, how to feed our search engines. So what are the challenges about this architecture or about these search engines? So the first challenge is that these uh, search engines are good in, in aggregation. So they can collect the data and you can make searches on it, but they are not good in the connected data sets. So when you have social data or all the stuffs, IoT, so you have a very connected data set. So in the basic setup, like the, on the slide, the previous, uh, you have a search engine and if there are two different users and use the same search query, they will get the same result. That's the typical setup. So we have to have to enrich the search results, the hits, to get more personal results. And that's why we should uh, we should bring the graph edit search into this search architecture. Uh, and we not just have to boost our results, 
because we have to boost the results because basically it's a recommendation engine because we should recommend something to the user who performs the searches. We should filter out some things which are not relevant for the user. For example, in the UK, the football results of NFL in the US is not relevant, so we should filter it out. So that's why we should uh, extend our search architecture uh, and because we are looking for the things and not the strings. So that's an important message. And, and we can go on with this. For example, this is a simple search. Everybody knows it. It's the LinkedIn search box. So if you are, if you are searching for a name, uh, it will search the whole database of LinkedIn, so you can get results from everywhere of the world, but it is enriched with the, with the social network of mine, so I can get more personal information and more personal search results. It's a good example how to use two different search paradigms together. So, to make this happen, we should have a knowledge graph behind this. So knowledge graph is a, is a graph, yeah, it's a graph. So the nodes are the entities in the world and the edges are the relationships between these entities. So it's about how, how we see the world so we should understand uh, the same things. Uh, and if I'm looking for something, everybody should know what I'm thinking about when I search. So it's an uh, important thing. So, so knowledge graph. Google has a knowledge graph. And uh, as I said, it, it's the search 5.0. So we should implement this search 5.0 in our corporate or in application. So in Google, the knowledge graph is the sidebar. When we are looking for something common, uh, beside the pages we found, uh, we should show something which is more relevant, and this is the entities in the world. And most of the time, uh, this is the thing we are looking for. So. This is the knowledge graph by Google. So the message is that we should build a knowledge graph inside a company. How to do this, how to do that. So <laughs> the first idea, go to Stack Overflow and ask the others how to build a knowledge graph. Uh, it's cool. You can get a lot of inspiration. You can get answers and mainly they said uh, Google do it better. Yeah, that's true. But we should build our own knowledge graph. So what are the requirements of a good knowledge graph and search uh, infrastructure? It should be easily integrated into our recent architecture. That's true because sometimes it's hard to get a new thing into the company and it's very challenging uh, if you don't have the support. So, so it should be easily integrated. And new data sources should be easily integrated. So you should use some connectors, plugins to get new data pipelines into the architecture. So this is the technical requi requirement. And, and one, I think this is the most important. If you build a search infrastructure, you should support your strategic goals. Because if you are an e-commerce company, then your strategic goal is to sell sell the things. So your search infrastructure 
should support the recommendation and the selling. If you do some social network or similar, then it's about the connection. So you should support the people get get the relevant uh, connections, uh, like in Facebook or in LinkedIn. It should be scalable because it's big, and you should provide personalized results. And it should have a very simple interface and because you have to integrate it to your UI. So what are the steps? So the first step is to choose a graph database. Uh, there are some on the market. There is Neo4j, for example, uh, which which my personal favorite because I work for GraphAware who are doing business in <laughs> Neo4j consultancy. There are Kaylee, which, which is the background of the Google uh, knowledge graph. And there are some others, for example, OntoText Graph DB, which is concentrate on the NLP stuff. So you should choose one and start to build your knowledge graph. So how to do that? You should uh, extract the information in s inside your company and load it into the database. It's easy, <laughs> yeah. But most of the companies, the informations are in, in the head and not in the databases. So sometimes it's challenging. But you should collect a lot of information from the internet, for example, open data, you will hear some more about the, in the next talk. You can grab some data from the web pages. You can use uh, NLP stuff. You can use Stanford Dictionary, for example, or ConceptNet 5 as an NLP database. And you should, you should use your car, current company master data. So you have customers, you have products, you have a lot of information which should be a good uh, fit into this search box. So if you have all the entities, you, you should connect them somehow. And this is the work where most data scientists are recently because they should some they should find some relevancy between the entities. You should, uh, you should use your log files to connect the customers to the products and so on, the services. So it can be pretty, pretty complex. So it's not an easy job, but you can start in small and later it can be easily extended. So this picture is from my colleague, Dr. Alessandro Negro. Uh, he made a blog post about search relevancy last week, and I used the uh, pictures of him. So this is about the product catalog. If we have an iPhone 7, we have some description, we have some property of the iPhone, we have some connected products which usually are bought together with the iPhone. We have some description there and for the description we can have many many tags based on the on the on the NLP processing we do. So so and it's just one product and we can connect it other products, we can connect it to customers, we can connect it to different sales pipelines, so it can be uh, a complex graph, but it's very good for, for searching if we want to find the most relevant information for the end user. So, that was the basic search architecture, and we should extend it like this I described. So we have the data sources there, and we have some 
data pipelines. Yeah, we have microservices because that's cool. <laughs> we should have some. We have some processing, for example, Spark, and we should load the whole stuff into a graph database. This is the red database in the center of the uh, picture. It's actually it's Neo4j. So our graph database is the knowledge graph, and this is the single source of true. So, so this is the master database, and we should replicate the data from our knowledge graph into the Elasticsearch. We can use GraphAware plugin, which is pretty good in this. Uh, we can propagate the data from our knowledge graph into the Elasticsearch. So I think this was the most technical part of my presentation. No. There are some more. So we can use Kafka to ingest the data into our knowledge graph. We can have different topics, for example, one for products. If you have a new product, then all the information will, will go into the knowledge graph. We can have search topics. We can have some feedback from the search box, how the users are using the search box. We can have some feedback the customers who bought the products. So we should use all the data sources to build our knowledge graph. So we have Spark on the processing side. I, I mentioned we have Neo4j on the consuming side. So it's a command query responsibility segregation architecture, which means when we save the data, it has different data model when we provide the data to the to the end users. So, so basically, this is the architecture. We can use some technical stuff when we commit the data into the Neo4j. We can propagate, push it to the uh, Elasticsearch, and it's almost real time. Then we can use the search box to find the most relevant information. So that was technical and some of the business part. So uh, I, I bring two success story. One is the Airbnb. They use the exactly same infrastructure to propagate the knowledge inside the company. They call it tribal, tribal knowledge. Tribal knowledge means basically the unwritten rules in, in a community. So it's about the transparency because they have a lot of reports, a lot of Tableau dashboard, a lot of metrics. So they use this tool, this architecture, to make it transparent for everybody inside the company, company to democratize the data, and it helps to get easier onboarding processes and, and uh, easier business understand for the guys. Other success story is about NASA. NASA is good in these lessons learned databases. They, they used it in the Apollo program, and there are a lot of information there. So they loaded the 50 years of engineering knowledge into an L4G. So, and they use it even in the Mars mission, mission project. So they can learn from the failures in the past. So it was very helpful. And last year, there was a conference in London, the Graph Connect, and in the keynote talk, the CEO of NEO said that, that the impact of this project was NEO4G saved over $1 million and two years of work for NASA. It's pretty amazing. That means we can reach the Mars two years earlier as, as we planned. So it's pretty cool. So that was a an other success story. So the, about the resources, it, all of the parts are open source, so you can 
download to your machine and you can start build your own knowledge graph. You can use Neo4G, 3.2 is out. You can use Elasticsearch, there are the plugins, and there are a lot of open data you can use. So that's it. It's not a rocket science, <laughs> even NASA use it. So you can start it. So thank you very much. <laughs>